Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. We're going to be starting in about two minutes to give people a few minutes to sign in and get settled. Well, I am wildly looking for more graphics to add to my very shitty slides. <laughs> Happy Thursday. Hi, Don. <laughs> Hi, Jared. <laughs> is it your birthday? Did I hear it was your birthday? It is my birthday. I thought what better way to celebrate my birthday than to present with you today. Where's the cupcakes? They aren't here. I'm assuming they're coming later because <gasps> I was promised cupcakes. So Yeah, well, I, that's no joke. If you were promised better cupcakes, cupcakes. <laughs> there better be cupcakes. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> or they may be at my front door. I haven't looked outside yet. <laughs> Um, and I'm looking, okay, the recording's going, all this like fun, like, do I have things in the right place? It says it's recording. So for those of you joining us, this is being recorded today. This will go down in your permanent record. Yes. Mm -hmm. and now when people listen to it outside of this on demand, they'll wonder like, it's every day Dawn's birthday. Every yes. day is Dawn's birthday in my heart. <laughs> I will totally do that. <laughs> Ooh, we have chat bubbles. Ooh, Yay! Oh. I guess that's a sign that this is actually working and it people seems can hear us. Fantastic. Excellent. All right, we're going to kick off. I see people coming. I'm sure more people will come in over time because what is time anyways these days? You know, this is the first webinar that I have done since, I want to say a year. I want to say it's been a year and a half since I've done a webinar. Wow. Maybe two. It's been a long time. That is a long time. I've just <laughs> set things over. Wait a minute. Wrong way. Wrong way. Somebody just said, I hope the cupcakes aren't a lie. <laughs> we all hope the cupcakes aren't a lie. <laughs> I would be very Cake excited if they were a lie. lie. Yay! Okay, we're in there now. Move right. my mouse off that screen. Great. So, welcome to the Progressive Delivery, otherwise known as my birthday party webinar. Uh, thank you for joining me in charity. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to go through a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, after the webinar, you'll get an on-demand link emailed to you so that you can share this with other people. The conversation aspect of this will run about 25 minutes, and then we're going to do a Q&A at the end. Uh, please ask questions. We love questions. Uh, drop them into the Q&A button, Zoom toolbar, uh, to ask questions. Those are the best way for us to see them. Yes, we are uh, hoping for lots of questions. Like this is, this is, I think the material we have is pretty compact and pretty dense. Um, and we're hoping to just be able to talk through anything you guys have to bring up. Yeah. Um, so we already have one question asking if we get to eat cupcakes every day. Yes, you can mm. have cupcakes every day. Um, feel free to upvote questions so we know who wants to hear what. Uh, and I was going to check in to make sure you all can see and hear us, but I'm seeing you responding to us. So we know you can see and hear us. So that's excellent. Uh, quick code of conduct before we kick off uh, so we can all focus on what brings us together today, and that's learning. Um, we all assume good intentions here um, when you're chatting or communicating in the Q&A. Please avoid any shaming language in the chat and questions. Um, if anyone has any issues or concerns, you can say so in the chat. Here, um, Kelly from Honeycomb and Alex from Launch Darkly are in chat and they're supporting and listening to us. Um, if you want to reach out more privately, um, you can select just panelists. And I believe the code of conduct has been pasted into the chat with like an email address for you to access as well. So now that we're done with all of that fun housekeeping stuff, let's get into the rest of it. Hi. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Dawn. I am a developer advocate at Launch Darkly, and I'm super excited and happy to be here today with Charity to talk about progressive delivery and feature flags. 
and birthday girl. <laughs> I am Charity um, Majors um, with my, oops, it's misspelled, Miss B. Tipsy, which, fun fact, was actually my EverQuest Enchanter's name. That's where that name comes from. Once upon a time, I played way too much EverQuest. Um, I am the CTO co founder of Honeycomb, um, and I'm here too. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to attempt to launch a poll that you can answer anytime during the webinar as we talk about progressive delivery. Um, we'd like to hear how you're using progressive delivery and probably should go ahead and define what progressive delivery is. Oh man, so host and panelists can't vote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming you use progressive delivery. <laughs> I say I do, just like everyone says they do observability. So, you know, <laughs> there's nobody checking, <laughs> no lie detectors yeah. there. So for, for us at Launch Dark, me, I see like progressive delivery is, uh, helps companies stay competitive it's by delivering small increments of change faster and safer. Like everyone wants to move fast, but you also want to be safe as you're moving fast. And that's one thing that progressive delivery is able to do because it inserts more checkpoints during the rollout so that you have more opportunities for testing, experimenting, and gathering user feedback to deliver uh, improved quality before you, you deliver. move with confidence, I would say. It lets you move swiftly with confidence because at each point you're you're check you're checking yourself and you're making you're you're actually looking at it. Am I doing what I what I think I'm doing? Am I doing what I set out to do? <laughs> Does anything else look weird? Right? And and I think it was monk chips, uh, James, who coined the term progressive delivery or maybe pop popularized it. But Popular. I'm a big fan uh, because I think it really it's it's a term that we've needed a word. We've needed a word to describe this for a while, right? You know, I used to talk about canaries a lot, but it's not just canaries, you know, it's, it's a whole constellation of stuff that's around um, deploying in, in a way that is not a big bang, right? It's the anti big bang. Right. So it allows you to like deliver first to like smaller, low risk audiences before you deliver to everybody and deal with that. Like, Oh no, like we've really broken something for really important customers, not that low yeah. risk. Raise your hand if you've ever deployed well. something and then it took far, it took five times as long to recover from the deploy than the actual deploy itself. And now your week is toast and you're just like, no deploys on Friday, which is the wrong lesson to take. <laughs> exactly. And progressive delivery allows you to deploy on Fridays. Exactly. Because as we're delivering those small increments of change, like you can feel confident, you can deliver it safer. Um, you also have this concept of software ownership. Um, Charity, I love the way that you describe this. It's like it closes the loops um, between dev and ops. So like it makes DevOps. Yeah, like I feel like thing. the DevOps split was a thing that should never have happened. Like it was, a, it was the wrong road that we went down. We were like, okay, this is getting hard and it's too much for one person to do. So we're just gonna make the people who build something like not the people who have to run it. So, but you have to have that original intent in your head if you're supposed to have, if you're gonna have any hope of debugging or understanding or maintaining, like those, they have to exist in the same brain. And so I feel like it, we're, we're finally starting to heal that rift, right? It fulfills the promise of DevOps, which is that you write it, you run it, you build it, you maintain it. Uh, and I believe that this shouldn't feel like a death sentence, right? It shouldn't feel like a punishment. It should, it should actually like, and like, I know that ops has a lot of, you know, there's a lot of blame to go to ops. Cause like we've been the, the martyrs and the masochists and just like, you know, taking pride in our, I got woken up five times last night. There was hair on my chest, blah, blah, blah. you know, like that's not fun. Nobody wants to join us in that world. Like, but I'm over 30. I don't want to live in that world either anymore. Right. And, and in fact, the only hope that we have as an industry of dragging ourselves out of that ro world and into a world where we, we, we build systems humanely in a way that you can be over 30 or 40 or 50 and still writing and supporting your own software is if we actually learn to do this, because this is what makes our systems better. Right. Like if, if, if you're shipping new bullshit every day out to that hairball of a system that you have it's like being a cat coughed up that nobody's ever understood right nobody's ever understood it and you just keep 
deploying more shit that nobody understands to it. Like, no wonder everything's on fire. No wonder people are miserable. And no wonder nobody wants to be on call. But like, I feel like that, the, I'm almost done ranting, I promise. But I feel like the, the biggest enemy that we have to face is our own, the fact that we've just accepted that this is how it is building software. It just has to suck, right? They're just have to be shitty parts that somebody has to suck it up and take. It doesn't have to be like that. Like it genuinely is possible to build and ship and run I mean, systems that are well understood, that are clear, that are intuitive, that, you know, you, that you don't have to fear deploys because, you know, because you have control. Of, all right, I'm done ranting. You've all heard it before. We can, we can move along. We'll move on. Software ownership. Ownership yes. is important. And, and honestly, like, this is what makes us enjoy our work, right? Well, what is it that, you know, Daniel Pink said that, like, the, the things that we all crave in our work are autonomy, uh, mastery, and meaning. And, and I feel like this is the element, this is the missing link that lets us get actual autonomy and ownership over our work. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. And that, that humane aspect is, you know, kind of the part of this progressive delivery, right? It's slowing down how you roll features out. So it's using this notion of release progression to see who gets impacted. And just because it used to be done, like with these big bangs, it doesn't mean it has to stay that way. You need to roll out features at a pace that's appropriate to your business. And now what's appropriate for one business does not make it appropriate for all businesses. Like We're just because Facebook or <laughs> Google or somebody else does it this way doesn't mean that you have to. Like think about the humans that work at your company mm -hmm. and the humans that are using your software and what works for them. Um, so when you're releasing, think, you know, do we want to do a targeted rollout? Are we doing canary launches, ring deployments, percentage-based rollouts? Um, or do you want to do a big bang? Sometimes you have to do a big bang, but for Sometimes the majority of things, you don't. You can take it in small increments. Yeah, I feel like this is like, you know, every single one of these socio-technical systems that we work on, every single company, every single one of them is different, right? We can learn from each other, um, but there is no... There's no substitute. At the end of the day, somebody has to understand and debug and fix and tune your socio-technical system. And it's not the same as anyone else's in the world. And this is why it's fun and interesting, right? There's no recipe book. There's no, there's no playbook that just like follow these, you know, five things because, you know, every single one of these systems are, are, are different and, and too complex to be reduced to just, just a playbook. But that's why it's fun. Yeah. And part of that as well is like, figuring out who's responsible, like empowering other people in the organization to be able to turn features on and off. Like this notion of like progressive delegation, who most closely is responsible for like the outcome of that feature. Um, I heard a talk, uh, most likely we did a customer trajectory nano series recently and Trade.io talked about how they use feature flags with Slack to allow sales engineers to, in the middle of a demo, enable a feature for a customer or disable that feature for a customer. That's badass. They're doing it 20 times a day. Can you imagine having to open a ticket or call an engineer and say, hey, can you turn this on? The sales engineer needs it in that everyone, moment. Everyone yes. does it. You want to empower the person who's closest to doing the work because they're the ones who know what needs to be done. You know, everybody belongs in production, right? Like, we've erected these massive gates just like keep everyone out of production because it's so scary because we were so used to it being so fragile right it's just like stay away I'm, I'm pretty sure as soon as someone touches it everything's just gonna go up in flames uh and and but like <laughs> there is a competitive there's a serious competitive advantage um in making production a welcoming place making it a, a playground with, with guardrails and you know with safety features but like a place that welcomes everyone in because everyone does a better job when they're close to production exactly so i did mention like, a little while ago this notion of feature flags and how they were used um, within slack um i do want to make sure everyone is aware of what a feature flag is in case you haven't heard of them um, Feature flags from uh, LaunchDarkly's perspective and my perspective are control points that allow you to alter the behavior at runtime based on targeting rules or external 
input. So this notion of progressive delivery is enabled because you insert these decision points or like a fancy if statement, if you will, into your code to say, these people have access or I want 5% of my users to have access. What to I love this about too. this is that this is what decouples releases from deploys. Absolutely. That whole notion of releasing on Friday, it's not releasing a feature on a Friday. You're deploying yeah. the code, There's a put it out difference. there. Don't show it to anybody for Friday, but just put it out there and see what happens in the system. You should be able again. to ship your code continuously. Like every time you, every time you save your work, you know, and you, you, you ship a diff, you know, you merge it back. Like that should, that every, I'm a big, you all know, I'm a big fan. Every time that you merge back to main, it should automatically get picked up, run through tests and deployed to master within minutes. Um, that does not mean that it is necessarily live for all your users to use it. That would be terrifying and stupid. Like nobody is suggesting that. And feature flags are the are the special sauce and the magic that let you have your cake and eat it too. Absolutely, and it's great to see in the poll results that about twenty percent of the people on here today say they're already a pro pro with feature flags. Uh, Thirty seven percent have just started using them great. Um, 36 haven't yet and 7% used to use them but now are on the team that doesn't. So we've got a 50-50 split between those using them and those that aren't using They're them. They're addictive, aren't they? Like once you once you start using them, it's just like, oh, I could use it for this, I could use it for this, and I could use it for this. <laughs> it unblocks you in so many ways. It makes it so much easier. Like it lowers the barrier um, while improving, you know, the, the safety threshold. It's, it's a pretty Touchy question. Yeah, I just took over um, the website for the school's PTA and I was trying to do something. I'm like, I just need a feature flag. Turn this stuff off. And I was like, Why it's so can't hard I to have a It's so hard to go back. You go back to a world where it's all on or all off for everyone. It's just, how do we ever survive? <laughs> no, not possible. So we've talked about, you know, Feature flags and progressive delivery, and that other aspect to all this progressive delivery is observability. So, Charity, do you want to chat about this? Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of <laughs> it, most of us. You know, I I'm an ops engineer, and you know, the entire the experience that I had, you know, and capsule summary. You know, I I was at Paris, and it was on fire, and I couldn't figure out what the fuck was going on. We were doing microservices, but we were microservices. We we're doing a lot of shit. We also had like a million mobile apps, you know, and they were going down all the time or they were complaining about being down, whether they were down or not. Um, and they, there was like shared pools, you know, of services, shared pools of databases. And so they could go down when someone who shared any one of those pools with them happened to get featured in the iTunes store. It was just literally impossible. You know, like y'all are flying blind. <laughs> if you have monitoring tools, if you're using metrics and monitoring, um, you do not realize just how blind you are flying. Like the ability to slice and dice, to break down by like high cardinality dimensions, like build ID, and then and then see like the impact of what you have shipped at a, at a very granular level. Like I started Honeycomb because the idea of going back to you know the I'm not going to name <laughs> competitors names <laughs> the, the the world of metrics monitoring. It felt like going out to drive down the freeway without my glasses on, which if you know how blind I am, you know it's a terrible idea. You know it's like you, you have a vague sense of what's going on, but you can't actually isolate or pinpoint or compare or see, you know, the context or correlate. Ugh, all right, anyway, TLDR, it matters. Um, it matters a lot. And, and it matters because it, it, you know, this is not just about, you know, being a, a better way of operating your software, which it is, but it's about pulling that, that whole act of, of validating way back into the development cycle so that you're practicing instead of just like TDD, like test driven development, you're practicing like TDD is great, right? But it abstracts away everything um, interesting about the world. It's just like anything that could possibly be chaotic or random or, you know, concurrency. It's just like, well, that doesn't exist. <laughs> now let's run our code, which is not useless, but it's also not that useful, right? Like, and when you're practicing observability-driven development, what that means is, as you're writing your code, you're instrumenting it. You're aware that future you is going to need to understand, is this doing what I want it to or not? 
right? So you're writing your code, you're instrumenting it so that you can answer that question, you ship it, and then you go and you look at it through the lens of your instrumentation and you ask yourself, is it doing what, I, what I'm trying to do? Is it doing what I wrote the code to do? And does anything else look weird? And I know that last question sounds very fuzzy and like, wouldn't it be nice if it could be more specific, but it can't. <laughs> Weird is, is, is un, it can't be defined lower than weird, right? And this is why it's important to be in production every single day. So because if you aren't looking at production when it's not broken, you don't know what healthy looks like. And then you can't trust your gut instinct, right? Like your gut instinct is a powerful tool. If you ship some code and you go and you look at it and you're like, what's that? <laughs> That sure showed up at a funny time to just the subset of posts that I deployed to. Uh, well, you know, you, that moment right there is the most powerful time in all of creation for you to find the bugs in your code because it is fresh. It's fresh in your head. You know exactly what you're trying to do. You know exactly what you just did. You haven't forgotten it yet. You haven't paged it out to the desk. You haven't moved on to another problem and you're looking at it right there. You know, when people start practicing observability-driven development and regularly looking at their changes, you know, minutes after they make it made them in prod, 80, 80 to 90% of bugs, I know that sounds like I'm pulling that out of my ass because I am, <laughs> but, but, also, but also experience. I, they, we find shit so fast before our customers ever have to experience it, right? Because you're there, you're looking at it. It doesn't have time to curdle. It doesn't have time to fester over months. It doesn't have time to become the new normal, right? Uh, that time right there is the most powerful time in, in all of history for finding the bugs in your code. But it requires that you be instrumenting. It requires that you have that tight feedback loop. And it requires that you be able to break down by high cardinality dimensions, they have high dimensionality, all the stuff that I've been yammering on and on and on about for years on Twitter. So I'm not going to repeat myself here. Cool. We can move on. <laughs> We know, yeah. And looking at the poll results as well, similar to feature flags, about 50% of people are, right. actually, no, I'm doing the math wrong. 50, 47% have just started, 17% are a pro, so 60-40 split. This is a very educated crowd. I feel yes. like we're in a very elite company. <laughs> Excellent, yes. And you know, it's uh, one thing to talk about all these definitions, but like, my favorite thing is like hearing about like how are they used in practice yeah, yeah you know like honestly i am amazed that there are this many people here like because like i i'm so cynical about vendors like i don't know that i've ever gone to show up for a vendor's webinar <laughs> because they're just going to tell you a bunch of bullshit right like uh, we are, they're, we all got they're, they're here for my birthday i mean let's they're be here honest. for your like, birthday they're here for my birthday this is like an that awesome birthday sense. party that makes sense uh, but it's weird to me that I find myself in the seat of being a vendor. It, it really is. But um, I, I've experienced engineering teams before and after observability. You know, here, here's a, I'm going to one more small detour. I, I, I feel like anytime you're asking someone to adopt something new, like some new tools, some new practice, what you're offering them has to be an order of magnitude better than what they have today, right? I, in order to be worth their time, their energy, the energy of their team, of replace, because like none of this is, is your core business, right? You have a business. It is shipping value to users, and it's not this, right? The best you can hope for from this is that it gets out of your way, helps you do your job faster. You don't want to de dedicate a lot of time to it. So, so it really has to be an order of magnitude better than what you've got. And I feel like it's just in the last year or two, year or two, that um, I feel like I can say full throatedly, honest to God, that I feel like, you know, not any one of these tools alone, but this collection of tools is solidly an order of magnitude better than what came before in terms of enabling teams to move faster, helping teams like move safely, helping them not get paged in the middle of the night, helping them find their bugs when they've, when they've shipped them. You know, I feel like, you know, if you look at the Dora report, just like year over year, like the elite category just kind of showed up two years ago as a little seven percenter. And then the next year it's like 22% and it's like achieving liftoff velocity. And those are the people who are adopting these best practices. Um, God bless the people who suffered through earlier versions that were just like twice as good. Anyway, so progressive delivery, like you were just talking about getting very concrete and, and specific. And when I think of progressive delivery, these are some of the things that you go back one or- Oh, sorry. A couple to, <laughs> yeah. 
uh, some of the things that come to mind for me um, are, so the, one of the first times that I really had to invest in, in this was when we did a rewrite at Parse from a Ruby API to Golang API, like, <laughs> you know, it's like replacing the engines in a jet while it's flying. It's, it, it, was, it was insanely hard. Um, also, uh, it, it helps you, you, you can set things up so that you can, you can fork the output, right? So that you, you, ship, you ship your code to a node that forks it and then returns a good result to, to the user diffs the output so you can see is your new code actually you know is it the same is it different is it faster is it slower um it's really useful for dark bunch and shit it's useful for rolling out to groups of people like this is different than, than rolling out to percentages rolling out to changes in waves a lot of people miss this one and, and they'll do that you know they'll, they'll deploy one host and then a few hosts then 10 percent and then and then you know 25 percent and then they get to 50 percent and they're like great i'm done and they turn it on the rest and that is when your back end falls over, right? Like you can't forget that last, that last like 20, 30%, you actually do want, you know, when you get to the stage where you're running high capacity, you want to roll it out you know, progressively in percentages because, you know, that lock percentage isn't actually going to kill you until you're, what is that noise? Uh, yeah. um, and decoupling deploys and releases. Yeah, okay, you can move on. Excellent, yay. Um, and, first one that I wanted to talk about here was um, oh, the parse Facebook thing. Which I have a blog post about there's this, there's this gnarly ass, you know, well, we used Scuba, which was the forerunner of Honeycomb, right? This is when I first fell in love with, you know, observability and realized how different it was because the shit was literally impossible um, with Ganglia. Uh, sorry, not mentioning competitors. Literally impossible to do well um, until we got into Scuba. Um, Facebook, interestingly, so what Facebook does is they have this internal cluster of Facebook that they roll everything out to first. So like Facebook would go down for employees a couple times a week, you know, it would be like, oh, Facebook's down. Um, then after that, they roll it out to Brazil. I don't know what, what Brazil ever did to them, but Brazil gets it first. And, and then they roll, but they, they, they just start like geographically going around the world. So this is why, again, you have to know your product. You have to know your users. You can't take anyone else's roadmap for rolling your shit out because it won't actually work for you. You have to understand your stuff. Um, oh, yes, I was going to talk about the Honeycomb setup. So Honeycomb, <laughs> honeycomb uh, is actually deployed from a very small shell script. <laughs> um, it runs from cron uh, once an hour. And uh, um, and and we also so we have a dog food cluster, and then we also have a kibble cluster. So all of our production traffic gets sniffed, um, and and you know all of the analytics for from our users go into you know dog food one. And then because we also want to be able to understand our dog food cluster, we have sort of a meta dog food that's called kibble. So we deploy to kibble first, and then we wait like thirty minutes, and then we you know wait another thirty minutes, and then we deploy to you know production. Um, and again, it is fully automated. So as soon as somebody merges their diff back to main, you know, it kicks off, well, it does it once an hour, but it kicks off everything so that, so that you know that within an hour, your changes will be live in production every time, which is, which is, I would like to more like 15 minutes, but like the goal is to be, it to be short enough. So it's like muscle memory, right? It should just be a habit. Like there should not be enough time in there for you to go off and get distracted doing something else. That's what I wanted to be sure. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, oh, sure. this is just a, a graph of, you know, the Honeycomb deploy rolling out API server version changing there. Yeah. Um, and then example three, I thought that we had interspersed one of yours. I um, thought we had, we can move them. I can. Let's yeah. skip to yours and then go back to AB testing. Yeah. Your All right. So one of the ways that we do progressive delivery and use feature flags and observability data is by running experiments or doing A-B testing. One thing that we had heard from some of our customers that had very large number of flags is that the main feature page listed all the feature flags was taking way too long to load because there was no pagination on the page. So obviously the more flags you have, the slower it's going to be to load all of that. So when we were building up pagination, we wanted to make sure that we weren't hurting 
one group of customers that didn't have a large number of flags while we were helping those that did. So we ran an experiment where we bucketed out our customers and looked at page performance. We looked at backend stats and data as we were rolling this out to see how pagination would impact users if they had a large number of flags or not. Thankfully, those with a small number of flags didn't get negatively impacted. So we ended up rolling this out to production. But having that feedback loop, knowing that we weren't just trusting our gut, we wanted to know that yes, all of our customers were going to either benefit this or not be harmed by it um, when we were rolling it out. Um, the other really unique way that I think we use uh, some feature flags and observability is to automatically adjust our tracing on the fly. So we have these very granular targeting roles within LaunchDarkly and we've used them to tweak the experience of a user, but for the, where the user is the trace. So we've added the trace attributes to what normally is defined as a user attribute. And so what we want to do is in one instance, we wanted to trace the initialization code path for our SDKs. And we only wanted the initialization traced. We didn't want all of it traced. So we set up targeting attributes that would only look at various attributes uh, within that initialization path. Um, and our targeting rules operate from top to bottom. So if you see here, like the items on the top would execute first. So if it matches this, we're going to take the trace. If it didn't match those initialization patterns, then we wouldn't. Um, so this has been kind of a fun way that we use feature flags to uh, help with observability to either collect more information. Um, sometimes we'll say like we want to trace just a single customer because a single customer is having a problem. And so we'll just go and grab complete traces of everything for those customers. Um, so that's a fun way of doing it. Um, Charity, do you want to go back to your other example? And then yeah. I'll sure. finish up. Can you hear that squeaking behind me? Is it terrible? It's not terrible. OK, great. OK. Um, yeah, so this is a thing that um, Allison was just showing me this morning. She's been working on a new sign-up flow. And this is a very simple incredibly powerful and effective. The, this is a screenshot of um, the launch dark, darkly feature flag, where it's just like you set it up to be 50% the new one, it's up the old one, and if you go to the forward one, and then, oop, these are out of order. Go forward one more. I hit forward. No, I hit there we go. too quickly. And, and this is just like, we don't have like a constant stream of hundreds of signups, <laughs> but you can see, um, you can see of uh, them being broken down by the feature flag down below. And then the other one, the one we just passed it, is maybe testing the sign-up flow so you can see the results. Boom, it's so easy, it's so powerful, it's so much fun. Yeah, and I, I love the fact that we can like run these experiments to confirm that gut feeling, right? So like, yeah, I think this is gonna go better, but like, I don't wanna just base a decision on like, I thought, I want to have that data. Yeah, you want to you want to know. Yeah. yeah. And in the and in the battle days, what we used to do was HA proxy rules, giant regular expressions where we would like set like based on the hash prefix or something. We'd be like, well, we're randomly assigning you to this percentage, and then managing those rules just about robbed me of my sanity. Like, and and it, of course we we're generating them from chef cookbooks, and so it was just scary. All right, so in the interest of time here, I'm gonna yeah, jump in. Us along. To, I know, <laughs> I know. Um, I'm gonna jump into some We're Q and A. That. Yeah. Um, actually, you know what? I think I only had one more example. I did. Yeah. It would be remiss of me not to talk about this because this is something really cool that Launch Darkly and Honeycomb just did together, where we've implemented flag triggers. Um, this was just launched last week by Launch Darkly, where you can have a private or a secret URL where when a threshold is passed in Honeycomb, it will automatically disable the flag in LaunchDarkly. 
So it really puts in those safety mechanisms that we've been talking about. And instead of trying to go and be like, oh, I've got to go turn that off. Like it's all just done magically between like Honeycomb and Launch Darkly. Um, we've got more information about flag triggers on the site. So I'm not going to spend more time, but I wanted to let you know that that information is out there. Cool. Now we'll jump into the Q&A. Questions. Questions. Um, so the first one that came in from Adam says, what are the guardrails that you would put in place before letting everyone enable disable feature flags in production? It depends. <laughs> depends on many things. You know, like how large is your team? How much do you trust them? How literate are they? Have they ever used them before? Like, are they, you know, um, John, why don't you take this? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I can as well. Like what, what we do is we have um, the ability to set tags and control who in an organization can disable flags. So you may have those operational feature flags that you don't want somebody in marketing or sales engineering to toggle on and off, but you want a sales engineer to be able to toggle a feature on and off in the middle of a demo to show, hey, here's how we do this. Um, right, that example that I gave earlier from one of our um, customers, Trade.io. And so you put those safeguards in place where people only have the ability to toggle the flags that are relevant to them um, through tagging, um, RBAC, things along those lines. Um, next question. Um, okay, sure. I yeah, there is, sorry. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's like, what are your thoughts on trunk-based development and constantly merging behind a flag versus working in a branch and only merging I mean, when done? This is just like one of those religious practices. You just pick one, you know. Like I, I, I honestly think it's my preference is to be constantly merging behind a flag. You want your code. You don't want it to get stale. You don't want it to get moldy. Code gets moldy. You need to get it into production. Production where it stays fresh. Absolutely. Um, another question here. Let's see. I've never used or known anyone who has used feature flags or the kind of observability that Honeycomb provides. I struggle to imagine how that could work without extensive rewrites to our code. Can you talk a little bit about how that integration actually yeah, happens? Yeah, yeah. It, there's no rewriting at all. Just like add the library and you're done. That's it. Yeah, so from like the launch directly perspective, it's for install an SDK and then it's a few pieces of code that you wrap around the features that you want to control via flags. I mean, um, a lot of work has gone into making this easy for you. <laughs> let's, be, let's put it that way. Uh, but like it used to be much harder, um, but now it's quite easy for both of them. It's, it's very, you know, there's plenty of copy paste. You just install the library and it's all done for you. Absolutely. Uh, if you feel the company should already have some prerequisites before embracing feature flag concepts for it to be successful from day one. Um, particular automation that should be in place. I mean, this is not really one of those, you must be this high to ride this ride sort of scenarios because it is one of the things that helps protect you from the bad things. Um, more <laughs> extensive test coverage is never the wrong answer. <laughs> That's always a great thing to have. But like feature flags are a thing that protect you from catastrophes. And so like it's kind of like saying, should you make sure that like the doctor has bandaged you before he like does your before he fixes your arm? It's just like they they achieve the same goal of making you safer in production. And you know what I would add to that is if you're starting with feature flags, like we would love for you to go and like feature flag all the things, but start small. Start yeah. with like a start lower with, risk a project, a lower risk feature. Yeah. I would, I would say actually, so I slightly disagree. Uh, instead of lower risk, I would say start with something that matters. Start with something that is important that you're working on actively every day. Um, Cause you don't want it to just be like something that is, low impact, not important, and just kind of off there where people are going to forget about it. Because it's about really like working, same, same with instrumentation, right? People are always asking me, how do you roll out, you know, better instrumentation? I'm like, imagine it's like 
it's like a headlamp. <laughs> and everywhere you go to fix something, the first thing you do is you add instrumentation and you add feature flags. And that, that way, like it's being actively, you know, it's not going to get the code rot and smell, you know, it's, it's going to be actively used because that's, that's what it's there for, right? It's, it's there to help you while you're actively changing things so that you're changing things safer. It's not to like get put out to pasture. That's not the purpose of these tools. Absolutely. Um, another question that I'm seeing here is, I think this came up a, a few different ways, so I'm gonna paraphrase a question. Um, and it's about like hierarchy of flags and controlling who sees what and if there's, you know, dependencies. Um, so is there like a shared view, things along those lines. Um, so yeah, we, within, launch darkly we have this notion of like a flag hierarchy where you can have a prerequisite so if you're building a, a new home page and there's four widgets on it you would have five flags one for the home page the new home page and one for each of the four widgets and the four widgets would depend and have a prerequisite of that home page flag be enabled so you do have this notion of like our features can accidentally be shown when like they shouldn't be shown. Um, so you have this, uh, these hierarchies and permissions within there. Somebody, somebody uh, said, we struggle to sell developers on our outside our platform team on flags and different rollout strategies. Um, what ways of effectively encouraging teams to adopt these practices that we've seen? Um, oof. My first answer is put them on call because usually exposing them to some pain will do it. Um, and he says they are, and leads specifically are the ones enabling the old ways. Ooh, this is, that's terrible. Um, hmm. uh, so they are on call. Is, are they, un, is it miserable? Like, are they in pain when they're on call? Like they're, they're suffering, right? You know, yeah. So honestly, um, depending on who you are, what your position is, what your, appetite for you know battle is you know you can try enlisting managers because one way to make, get this stuff um to take root is to make sure that it's clearly written into your say leveling documents so that like senior engineers are expected to you know uh, adopt new practices you know to do things the right ways you know uh, these are the tools that managers have so like if you've got the managers on your side you can enlist them and it's kind of a slow way sometimes of bending that 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 curve um, because really you know the senior engineer you're going to be more, most effective at embracing new ways in better ways if your senior engineers are not only on board but like understand that why that matters um it's going to be up, i'm sorry there's there's no like magic bullet it's going to be an uphill battle without that um you can the advice that i often give people in the situation is quit find a company that deserves you. Seriously. Um, you shouldn't have to like go down with the boat. Yeah, so it's all not right. an easy thing to do all the time, but sometimes like find the companies that are more willing to embrace these types of practices versus They're this is there. the way we've done things. These are the way we will always do things. There are companies things. who are hungry for this kind of transformation. There are companies who would embrace you, who would welcome these changes, who would look at you as a leader for bringing them. Um, question of how much of your life force do you want to try, try and expend and dragging people into the glorious future, kicking and screaming. Yeah, shameless plug, launch darkly is hiring. So, I don't know if Honeycomb is, but I'll throw that out there. Um, I have a question. Um, sure, if, if you have specific questions, just general, uh, I am always happy to take, um, if people send me emails with their situation, I will try to answer them in my blog in more of a thought out blog form. I've done that a couple of times and I'm happy to try. Um, if you send me all the details you have, I'll take a swing at it. Sorry, That's I can't okay. do more. Okay. Um, and another question that I really like here, um, and it's been upvoted a lot, so we're gonna go to this one, is like, how would you recommend using feature flags for infrastructure? changes um for example like rolling out you know new monitoring infrastructure rollouts or things along those lines um charity can talk to, has honeycomb done any of that for infrastructure changes i don't know 
that we've done that much with infrastructure. We don't, we try not to do much with infrastructure. You know, we do pretty boring stuff. Um, keep it simple, you know. Uh, Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we've done a number of infrastructure changes. Um, we have a number of blogs on our site talking about how we've done database migrations using uh, feature flags. Oh, yeah. um, we use feature flags for database migrations too, but I think it's just, you know, it's, it's all in the code base. You know, there, there isn't anything outside of that, so. Yeah, um, but the infrastructure changes is definitely not an area a lot of people talk about or think about when it comes to feature flags, but it definitely can be used. Um, we have a number of resources on um, the LaunchDarkly site about that. Um, and I'm happy to, uh, if you message me, um, ping me on Twitter, I'll find them and post them. I don't have them off the top of my head right now. Uh, so. And I'll go to this question too, because I love talking about technical debt, because who doesn't like talking about that? Um, curious, um, I could talk about what we do for best practices and to clean up feature flags to make sure they don't turn into technical debt. Uh, Charity, can you share like what Honeycomb does to make sure that flags don't uh, become stale debt? Um, sorry, I'm busy feeding links to somebody in the, in the text answer, so you go for it. <laughs> Great, no problem. Uh, so some of the things we like to do is we suggest tagging all of your flags with like a sprint date or a release date. And then you can search through and find like the older ones. We also have the ability in the interface to say when a flag's been completely rolled out. To everybody and if it's been completely rolled out to everybody and it's not an operational flag that's being used as a kill switch then that's a prime candidate for turning that flag off and removing it uh, we have uh, code references so you can very easily in the interface see all the places in your code that refers to that flag to make it uh, a less labor-intensive process to get that removed um, and one of my favorite ways of doing uh, feature flag cleanup is we've heard of companies that have uh, gamified it and they hold what they call like a capture what? the flag. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, come on, everything has to be a game. Somebody else <laughs> asked a question that got a, a threaded off of it and said, my company expires feature flags after a couple of minor versions. Is that a good idea? Is there a better way? <sighs> Uh, you know, that works. If it's rolled out, doing it like at a sprint, like go back, going back and saying, okay, like these versions have all rolled out. We know these are fully rolled out, then take them out. Um, you do need to make sure when you are going around that, that after those few versions, that flag has rolled out to 100% of users, um, or you're serving the same version to all of your users. What sort of latency is involved in fetching flags to values and states? Uh, tens of milliseconds? Very small, yes. Very, very, very fast, yeah. I, I'm just typing answers right now. That's fine, yeah, there's been a ton of questions out there. We will make sure they are all answered. Um, afterwards and if we didn't like i said you know ping me on twitter um i'm happy to strike up a conversation about any of this further uh i love talking about these types of topics so there we go um oh one thing that i will bring up that i saw here is I lost the question. There we go. Um, failure cases for a feature flag system. So you depend on a feature flag system to roll out a feature. That system fails. Now the feature is deployed to a larger or smaller target population. How do you guard for that? So for launch darkly, we have the um, functionality where you can put in a default value. So if for some reason you are your application is unable to communicate with launch darkly the default value is you know do you want that on or off so you would specify in this case you would probably want that default value 
to not serve the flag. So you have those the options to have those safeguards um, in place. So we have built that into our system. Um, we have a few minutes left. Um, I think I want to make sure everyone knows that we will have this recorded. We'll be sending out the slide deck, which has some links to information. Um, I will go and find the uh, infrastructure links and get those posted to Twitter for people. And any other questions? Um, like I said, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Charity, do you have any parting thoughts? Um, just, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm an ops nerd. I don't usually recommend software because I think you should run less software. Software is usually the problem, not the, not the solution. Um, but um, the highest performing teams that I've ever seen have embraced this shit. It's worth it. Great. So thanks everyone. Thank you all so much. It was a pleasure having you here and uh, Charity, thank you for having me chat with you. This was a lot of fun. Ah, man, there was stuff in chat that uh, I didn't see that people were asking questions over there too.